the General Assembly, uh, uh, if you don't know it, it is one of the best resources that we have here in town, along with WeWork and, and uh, the Cove and others. One of the things that's really great about our community now is the various places that exist for uh, our next generation of entrepreneurs to get training. I think one of the best, one of the best things that's happened over the last 10 years has been the growth of uh, co-working and acceleration programs. And sometimes we uh, have a tendency to overlook it. Universities have great programs. Uh, You've got 1776, you have Eastern Foundry specializing in national security. We are incredibly fortunate in this region to have a growing ecosystem uh, that is supporting the next generation of entrepreneurs. So yeah, I've been around 180 years. I came down here in 1998, in the middle of the first internet bubble, otherwise known as the aneurysm. Seen a lot of interesting things. Uh, Amplifier Ventures is a company that I started about 11 years or so ago. We specialize in basically innovation. You know, there's an investment side of the business. I've helped start a number of companies, including two companies that Mike Pratt and I did together, one of our panelists. We've sold some, lost some. It's, it's just a party. Uh, and then we do a fair bit of innovation consulting work. Right now, my biggest client's the Department of Defense. If you are aware, we're doing a program called Tandem NSI, where we are teaching the Pentagon how to work with entrepreneurs. It's a big job. Somebody has to do it. And I'm happy to tell you we're making a lot of progress. So. When I'm not doing that, my other big client right now is one of the largest faith-based organizations in the United States, helping them figure out how to do innovative new programs. So if you can imagine the bizarreness of my daily life, talking with people who make things go boom and talking to people who save souls in the space of a two-hour period, it's, it's very great and it's enriching and only in Washington, D.C. So somebody has pointed out this, that this uh, panel has a lot of Johns on it. I wasn't quite sure how to react to that. But uh, it is true, we, we do, and uh, as well as myself, we have Dr. John Holliday. John, uh, uh, as is the case for uh, a number of people on the panel, is an old friend of mine. He's an angel investor. He's executive chairman of Exos, uh, Exosite. Yeah, I remember that company name. A chairman of Biocore and founder and ex-CEO of Antramed, uh, successful biotech companies. He's been around and part of our life science industry for many years. He's been a banker, investor, and so forth. Have a lot of interesting things to say, I'm sure. Mike Pratt is currently managing partner of Select Venture Partners. Um, it's kind of interesting to me, having had a long career as a successful entrepreneur, growing and selling a couple of companies that would choose to go to the dark side. I'm sure he'll explain why he thought that was a good idea. Um, John Tullis, who I, I'm just meeting for the first time, is managing director of Tullis Health Investors. He's a health investor. And then, Nate Johannes, is that right? That's correct. Thank you. And you are the Senior Advisor, Office of Investment and Innovation at the USSBA. You work with Mark Walsh. Mark is our new, my new boss. That's correct. And, and, and an old friend of mine. So uh, if it goes well, I want you to go back and tell Mark I said hello. Likewise. There you go. All right, guys. So, so let's, uh, since we have a room of people who are interested in, in the in investment community, let's just start here. Let's go down the row. What are you all doing right now from the standpoint of being investors? What are you looking for? How are you involved in the investment community? And I'll start with my favorite, John, here to my left. John, go ahead. Good morning, everybody. It's a great pleasure to be here. I thank Tien and Jonathan for the opportunity to share some thoughts and some stories with you. I have had a very rich career uh, in the life sciences and enjoyed it greatly. As it turns out, 15 years ago, I started a company called Entremed. Uh, we became very much in the news on May 3rd, 1998, not that I remember, <laughs> when uh, the New York Times announced that we were going to cure cancer in two years. Um, quite a challenge. What we were doing with Entremed is finding a way to block the growth of blood vessels that feed tumors. And in so doing, you can decrease the growth of the malignancy. We developed thalidomide all the way through phase two studies, sold that to Celgene, became a great way of helping people with various forms of malignancy. Um, but, you know, after curing mice of cancer, I still get thank you notes all the time. It's, uh, it's an important thing. Cancer, as, as you probably know, is one of the biggest problems that we have to deal with in terms of our own health and the health of the families and friends, uh, and how do you deal with cancer. A lot has happened in the last few years in particular. What's the problem with cancer? A fundamental problem is that the immune system does not recognize malignancies. It just waves on the way by a tumor and leaves it alone. Maybe many of you saw that last Sunday, Jimmy Carter announced that he'd been cured of his uh, cancer. He had a brain cancer that was metastasized uh, from uh, primary melanoma. How did that happen? 
Well, a company called Bristol Myers Squibb invented a drug called PD-1, it's Opdivo, which takes the brakes off the immune system, which means that the immune system no longer rides by the malignancy. It says, wait a minute, I've got to pay attention. In the last uh, three years, I've started another company, this one headquartered in Singapore, for various reasons that I won't go into, where we have taken some now patented technology that doesn't take the brakes off the immune system, but it puts the accelerator on the immune system. Now let me tell you a brief story about that, and then I can tell you a little bit about how we're going about financing the company. The, um, the immune system has a challenge, and that is how does it recognize the various markers of malignancy? As it turns out, cancer cells are not readily squirted into the bloodstream in a measurable way. But what they do is they secrete little balls of bad news. These are called exosomes. What these exosomes do is they carry the malignant message from the source of the primary malignancy, and it's now known as of a paper in October that they are the way that cancers metastasize. So for instance, a lung cancer will squirt off some exosomes, little balls in the bloodstream, which lodge in the brain, corrupt it, and then set up shop. The malignant message is in these exosomes. They contain the genes, the proteins, etc. How do you put them into the immune system? Years ago, I co-founded a company called Maxite, which is still a private company run by Doug Dorfler. And Doug and we started a company around a process called flow electroporation, a lot of big words. The simple story is this. You collect from a patient their exosomes from their blood. You collect from a patient, that same patient, their primary immune cell, called a dendritic cell. You put the two together with an electric current which opens windows in the immune cell, and now the immune system, when it's put back in as a vaccine, says, I know where to go and what to do. I've got the message of the malignancy. We're early in the process of developing the company, I'm pleased to comment that we have a strategic relationship that's under discussion, uh, but right now we're in the fundraising uh, mode. Now, over the past in raising monies for these companies. Yeah, okay, that's where I want to get to. Uh, okay. I've, I've started three public companies, never used venture money. Started with deep pockets, angel investors, and then we've gone, perhaps sometimes precociously, into the public marketplace and done well. But without the uh, venture support, you often don't end up with the venture folks at your side so, if you need further support. So, John, I gotta, I, I'm sorry, I just, I wanna give our other guys a chance okay. to oh, chat. I'm sorry. No, no, not at all, because I think this is really important stuff. And, and what you're doing here uh, in this region for driving biotech is really, really important. And I wanna come back to it. Let me just ask you one quick question before we go on. Are you investing right now, or are you, are you still, do, are, you, are you an angel investor as we're appearing here? I'm an angel investor that invests in my own companies. Okay, that's yeah. good. All right, well, all right, well, so we'll get back to that, because I want to talk about uh, life science as a driver for our region going forward. Uh, so, so, Nate, you, I know what your office is up to, but why don't you give a little bit, uh, just a, as an, an investor and as what are you up to at the SBA in this particular office that's relevant to people who are entrepreneurs in this community? Well, well first, good morning and thanks, Tien, uh, for the invitation. I'm humbled to be in front of such a great audience and, and hear such great pitches. Um, I'm always impressed from companies like SkillSmart that, uh, that are really paving the way for something that uh, is much needed in terms of matching skills to employers. Uh, prior to joining the SBA, I'm a presidential appointee in the Obama administration, so everything I do or say does not reflect the views of the administration or my boss, Mark, and the administrator of the, of, of the agency. Um, I just said well, that. Well, 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 if it's creative, I'll, gi I'll give Mark the credit. Okay, there you go. Um, and so prior to joining the administration, I was a securities lawyer, a Wall Street trade group lawyer, well, I was doing a lot of Dodd-Frank Dodd vocal rule, uh, regulatory work, and, and now here I do with the Office of Investments and Innovation. I'll just give you a bird's eye view. First, has anyone heard of the SBIR program, Small Business Innovation Research? Great, so uh, in summary, 11 federal agencies give us 2% of their research and development dollars, and we, we bring it to our office, and that's a little bit north of $2.5 billion, and we hand out grants for R&D research and development contingent upon solicitations by the 11 federal agencies. And just to give you a fun fact, out of the $2.5 billion, DOD is half of our budget. Mm -hmm. So DOD's R&D dollars by far outweigh the rest of the, the, the 11 federal agencies. And on the other end of our office is the investment side of it, 
we're a fund of funds. Uh, my office, we're an LP. Congress gives us $4 billion to invest in the year uh, in, into, uh, into fund managers. We can lever a fund manager can leverage $225 million from our office. And since money's cheap right now, because we're charging a 10-year bond maturity rate, uh, you know, we, we've seen a huge flow of, uh, of GPs coming to us. Currently, we have about $25.2 billion in the market right now, managed uh, by roughly two, two, uh, 218 GPs. Uh, in, in fiscal year 2015, we've invested $6.2 billion into 1,210 portfolio companies. So we're an arm for fundraising. You are. And I'm going to ask a leading question for the home crowd. What's the number one region from the standpoint of getting money from SBIRs? The number one region? Um, I, I believe it's this area in particular. That's correct. You got it in one. Uh, there you go. <laughs> well, you, yeah. you know, uh, look, you know, what, what I always tell folks and, and uh, 60% of venture capital dollars go to 25 zip codes, 70% of venture capital dollars go to three states. And when we look at our fund, we do the exact opposite on the SBIC end of it. You know, 30, 33% of our, roughly 33% of our capital goes to women and minorities and goes to communities all across this country. And so, yeah, in the SBIC side of it, we're looking for fund managers sourcing the best deals from outside of that 25 zip codes and the SBIR program. We've, uh, we're continuing to look at the best uh, innovative ideas, and we just had a road tour where we visit the bottom 20 states visiting that right. they haven't received our capital to try to increase these states from receiving capital. So for the purposes of this room here, uh, afterwards, if they want to network and, and talk with you, you're a good conduit for understanding the SBIR program or how to connect the dots, in particular from an entrepreneur perspective today. That's right, as well okay. as if you're a venture firm or a private equity firm, BDC or a bank. We're happy to help as well. Okay, cool. And you know, I love that. I'm here from the government and I'm here to help. We don't get that enough, so that's great. That's right. And <laughs> I'm not running for office. Even better. John, tell us, you are, you're a healthcare investor? Yes. All right. I like that. Well, you should invest in John's company, apparently. So what are you up to? Uh, so uh, we're healthcare investors. Um, we invest nationally, a little bit outside the U.S., but generally as part of investing in a U.S. company. So if we're helping a company expand outside the U.S., but most of our investment is, is across the U.S., uh, kind of in line with what Nate was saying. We're, we actually focus um, a lot more on sort of the non-traditionally uh, core markets for venture and growth equity. So uh, a lot of our investments are throughout the central U.S., western mountain states, southeast, uh, Mid-Atlantic, as opposed to sort of Boston, uh, you know, Palo Alto, San Diego, which are much more traditional hubs for for a lot of healthcare. Um, we uh, we've been in business for uh, thir just now 30 years, um, and our focus is uh, on sort of growth stage companies. So what we are looking at across the healthcare space, and this for us this includes kind of all sectors of healthcare: medical devices, uh, biotech, healthcare technology and services. Um, to some degree diagnostics. What we're looking for is companies that have achieved a lot of the sort of technology development, um, generally have gotten through an approvals process with the FDA if that's required, and have begun to, to develop commercially. And where for the company, it makes sense to continue and push that commercial development for a period of time before they look to exit, whether that's an IPO or a trade sale. Um, that's not for all companies. Some companies exit before they ever get commercial, but there's a, there's a part of the market that needs to go out and kind of prove um, that they have a product or service that really has commercial viability. And, and actually, in this day and age, that's becoming increasingly more important, both in the IPO markets and the, and the trade sale markets, because of a variety of factors that are driving costs down and expectations up uh, for new products. So typically, um, we invest in companies that have sort of five to 25, five to 30 million in revenues. They're generally not profitable. They're usually in a hyper growth mode and really trying to continue to expand. And we're trying to come in and help them do that effectively and efficiently. That sometimes includes uh, companies that have venture backing previously, but a lot of times it doesn't. So a lot of times yeah. it's companies like what you do, where it's friends and family, angel investors, they kind of get it to a certain point, and then they say, you know, it'd be nice to have somebody at the table who can open the doors with some additional, you I'm, know, I'm telling you right now, you two aren't leaving the stage unless there's a checkbook out. <laughs> I gotta pay you? <laughs> no, 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 I'm trying to help you, buddy. I'm trying to help you, it's all about you. So, uh, yeah, so, so that's, that's basically what we do, and, um, and, and actually part of our approach is that uh, virtually all the companies that we invest in are companies we've known for some time. So we actually spend a lot of time in the angel community and in the new company community, even though we don't give seed capital or invest in early stage, 
we like to get to know companies at that level. And what we find is that if we build a relationship over a period of one, three, four years, sure. when the time is right for the companies that do ultimately want growth capital, it's a very organic process where there's a relationship and a clear That's thing. right. So Absolutely. And now Mike Pratt, who's an old friend of mine. Mike, you're... You're, stump, you're helping to start companies now with Select Venture Partners. Yes, Tell hi, us what you're hi everyone. Uh, thanks, Jonathan. Yeah, first of all, very nice to be here. Thanks to TN and company. And thank you for sticking around. Um, so uh, I spent uh, 16 or 17 years as an entrepreneur myself, uh, being involved at various levels of sea levels in uh, companies over the course of uh, anywhere between, let's say, 11 and 13 companies, depending upon how you count them. Uh, we had five exits, and, um, and Jonathan has invested in a couple of those companies. And my last company was acquired in, um, in uh, February of 2014, and I decided uh, Jonathan wanted to know why I went to the dark side, and I, I think part of the reason I went to the dark side is because uh, as an entrepreneur dealing with uh, early stage uh, venture capital funds, I realized that they weren't necessarily um, the, the best partners at all times because many of them didn't understand the, the woes of entrepreneurs. Uh, so I decided that I would put together a fund of what we call entrepreneurs helping entrepreneurs. So I took some of the exit money that I made and I started a fund with three other partners, all of whom have had operating experience, I mean really big operating experience, all of whom have had exits along the way. We put a million dollars of our own money into the fund and we raised another almost four million so that we have a small five million dollar fund. We invest in early stage companies. Um, we look at, we're post friends and family, we're pre-series A, generally speaking, although we have, you know, we don't, we have done things that don't exactly fit that model. Um, we tend to focus on our own expertise, which is enterprise software, SaaS-based delivery solutions to, that, that service either the healthcare industry or the education industry. We do a lot of mobile application type things. We've made 10 investments thus far. Uh, we, we generally make small investments. $250,000 is our sweet spot. We keep a little bit of money on the side to do follow-on. And, and the one thing that makes us different, I think, is that we all are actively involved in helping the companies be successful. And, and that's whatever that necessarily means, uh, depending upon what the company needs. Um, uh, I've, you know, um, some of the people that we've invested in, some of the companies we've invested in are represented here today. I don't know if Rick Fleischer is still here, but urgently, uh, Rick, is Rick here? Uh, he probably had to go get get back to work, but yeah, uh, like hopefully, back to work. yeah. <laughs> so we invest. It was our very first investment. Uh, I'd worked with Rick in a couple of earlier companies, and uh, pleased to to be able to say that our our measure of success is that we take a company from kind of their post friends and family round and get them to where they can demonstrate to a serious investor that they're they're worthy of a Series A investment, and that's so hard to get done. If you're an entrepreneur, you know how hard that is to get from to get a Series A investment, particularly in this part of the world. So, uh, urgently, actually, just recently announced that they had a seven million dollar Series A that was led by a venture capital fund that was based in Salt Lake City that we introduced them to, and also included Verizon and um, Allianz Insurance as the two strategic investors. Um, so, um, in addition to what I'm doing in the fund, uh, I have three other partners. One is based in this area. One is based in New York City, one is based in Salt Lake City. Um, and, um, you know, we tend not to f focus too heavily on geographic region. We look more at the deal. Uh, we've, we've had a very kind of broad base of, um, of investments we've made thus far. But in addition to that work, which takes quite a bit of time, as you can imagine, I also, uh, Jonathan inspired me as his work as an adjunct professor at the Smith School at Maryland. Uh, and I suggested one time that I might be interested in doing some adjunct professorship work uh, and did some guest speaking with him at his, uh, in his classes. And Jonathan, uh, you know, took me up on that offer and forwarded me an email from the engineering school that said they were looking for a, a person, which I thought was an adjunct professorship, but it turned out to be a full-time job. So I'm now... That's why I turned it down. What's that? That's why I turned it down. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's amazing uh, to do. It, you were dealing with young, bright uh, Maryland students. I don't know if you know Maryland as a university, but it was recently named, the entrepreneurial program at Maryland was it recently named as one of the top 10 entrepreneurial programs in the country. And it moved up this year from 20th position to 10th. 
and uh, a large part of that is what we're doing at the engineering school, which is essentially teaching technical people the STEM disciplines, how to how to start and how to start companies and how to raise money and and provide them with tools to enable them to be successful. And a lot of the engineering students that we're working with come out of the school and actually have started businesses while they're in the program. Big, yeah. almost, very big um, uh, success story so far. So that's what I do. So if you want something to add, you want I, I was going to say Mark Walsh would take the claim for that, who just stepped out from the chair of the Dickman School of Entrepreneurship. Yeah. But, uh, but, you know, looking at... Uh, I made Walsh. Is that right? Yeah, you tell him when you get back. I tell him I said on stage. Well, it's, I it's, made it's on the record now. That's right. I made Mark Walsh. That's right. Uh, but, but if you, if you look Watch at his head explode. <laughs> <laughs> I'm out of a job tomorrow. No, no. You can come work know. with me if that's uh, the case. But, uh, <laughs> but in the sense of looking at entrepreneurship as now of a career yeah. that we see in institutions, looking at it as more of a career rather than an option. So. Yeah, I think it's interesting. And so one of the things that, that I have heard chronically uh, over the years is that there's never enough venture capital. It's like there's never enough love in the world. And, but yet somehow we managed to have this great entrepreneurial community. Uh, let's start with the life science side. John, you've been here for a long time. You've grown great companies. How and why is it that notwithstanding this so-called chronic lack of venture capital, we seem to have the ability to generate great entrepreneurs or great companies in the region? You know, within the 10-mile radius of the NIH, there are more MDs and PhDs per square mile than anywhere else in the world. Lots of innovation and lots of ideas. And many of these people, like me, trained in the sciences, decide to go in and start businesses. I never had any training in business. I was a scientist, after all. And so we go out and find some angel money, which is hard to find now, because it's more like venture money, and get enough seed capital to do a little damage and take the company forward to try to find some way of further funding. A tough problem. The, uh, I think the environment around here is rich from the point of view of science, but does not have the venture money around. As you know, I think that's dropped off by 50% in the last decade since I ran the Tech Council. So you need to find the money and you need to uh, form an alignment. The, the venture companies we have locally invest out west, NEA and, and others. We need to keep them locally to support our community. So how are we doing it? So Mike Pratt, you've grown, I mean, I had a ringside seat, and I always worry when you say on stage you started your fund because you didn't like your investors. It's always, it's like a knife in my heart. But putting that, you know, that, that, that thing aside, you've grown a number of companies here in this environment. How did you overcome it? Or is the lack, of, from the software side, is, is the lack of uh, institutional capital continue to be an issue here? Well, you know, I think it is in this area. I, I really do. In fact, if you look at my portfolio, um, <coughs> The, the companies that have been successful, we've had a couple already, even though we've been around a little less than two years, we've had, a, I think, three companies thus far already go from our initial seed to a Series A. But none of those happened in the GTDC region. They also, they all happened outside of the, this region. Um, um, when I was involved in, in the business, it was a, a little different. I think there was more, back at, certainly back 10 or 15 years ago, there was a lot more Series A money in this area. More. A lot more, and now it suddenly has got, seems to have gone away. And as I was talking with someone, I think uh, Alan Snyder, who's maybe not here now, but uh, formerly of Boxtone um, and Good Technologies, um, uh, you know, now it seems to be primarily either seed money, a lot of seed money like us, or you know, B rounds, you know, growth capital, mm -hmm. where they're looking to you, you know, have, they, I actually got a call, I won't name the name of the VC, but I used to get a call like every three months from the VC saying, okay, are you 20 million in revenue yet? Because, you know, I want to give you 20 million, and, but we don't, our model is you got to have 20 million in revenue before you will give you 20 million in growth capital. And I'd say, you know, I didn't have 20 million in revenue last three months ago, and I still don't have 20 million in revenue. So, um, <laughs> so I think what happened, in fact, in, in my last company, in, in uh, SpiderSafe, mm. which Jonathan was an investor, by the way, a very good investor. There you way. go. Yeah. Glad we have that on the record, Very too. good advisor. Um, uh, <laughs> well, I was actually actively looking for Series A money when, yeah. when my acquirer happened to um, approach me and offered to buy us. So, um, and Mike, Mike Labriola, who is our counsel, and yeah. you know, I will get, put a big plug in for Wilson Sonsini, yeah, and for great. Mike himself, as, as a great, a great uh, venture firm to, to work with. Um, you know, he, he, he knows how that worked, and we basically went from being raising money to basically negotiating the acquisition of the company uh, by a very large security company out in California. So, um, so we, we basically, didn't find the Series A, but we found an acquirer instead. 
Nate, that's something that I think that you all with the SIBR program, I mean, that, that's what you're trying to solve, isn't it? That 100% correct. You, uh, really, we're, we're investing R&D dollars to companies that are such high growth, innovative uh, 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 institutions or small businesses, but in the sense of either too risky for, uh, for, for VC or not in the realm of PE. So the, 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 you have the value of death. And, and so looking at uh, our program, it's really to, it, to fill the gaps where the gaps are widest, which are high growth companies and American small businesses. And you know, uh, the ultimate validator of that is Congress who authorizes it. And you know, for the past, since 1980, there's been an increase of capital being invested into the uh, SBIR program because of the success stories. You know, we look at Qualcomm and, and 3D technology or, or Semantic or the Biogen biotech industry. Uh, these were, or 85% of your smartphone, these were SBIR technologies that have been commercialized to, you know, the return on investment of the American taxpayer has been 1,000x, so. And it's really important for those of you that don't know, the, the Small Business Innovative, Re Innovative Research Program. So last year, it put $120 million in just in Virginia-based small businesses, and that's $150,000, $500,000 at a time. And so it, it really is, uh, the NSF, for example, puts tens of millions of dollars in the startups in our region. And what's important to understand is that, yeah, it's a pain in the butt to apply. You have to go to Fed Biz Ops and do a little bit of understanding of how the government works. But you get the money, it's not equity. It's not debt, it's a grant. You don't actually have to give anything up and you can use the money to develop a product that you can keep commercial rights to. It's, it's, it literally is, if you remember that late night TV advertisement with the crazy guy with the question marks, you know, the government gives you free money, he shows you the phone book of all the free money. The reality is the SBIR program is the government giving you free money. They hate it when I tell you that, but, uh, but that is a way to think about it. This region probably would not be as, as, as successful as it is at developing new startups if it was not for the federal R&D dollars. That's right, and you know, one of my favorite success stories is recent, uh, where a small firm uh, in, in, in Northern California received early stage R&D dollars, and, and, uh, which is, it's a grant, so, we, and we help you commercialize it, so there's a tech transfer aspect of it. So our office is SBIR uh, slash STTR, Small Tech Transfer Research, because we, we want you to commercialize it. And uh, they created a spoon for folks that have Parkinson's disease because the NIH realized that this is preventing them from eating in public. That has caused them to, that has had in turn much larger health ramifications. And Google bought the spoon from Lyft Labs for $250 million. So that early stage uh, capital they received from the SBA, you know, up to $2 million, has trans translated to $250 million for this one company. So uh, one other question for the panel before I see if you all have a, one or two is, so what are some of the strategies that you all have seen entrepreneurs use successfully to grow businesses in the lack of uh, institutional capital? I'll start with you, John Holliday. You've had experience with that. What would you recommend entrepreneurs do? Well, about 15 years ago, Steve Meltzer, whom we all know, and I wrote an article, How to Attract Angel Investors. And in certain fields of medicine, for instance, it's someone whose mother died of whatever disease, and they'll throw a million dollars at you, and God bless them, it's kind of dumb money. They don't know what the company's like, when they'll get a reward, or how to work it. That's not there anymore. The angels have all come together in a common group. They do the diligence of a venture group. And so that's one of the reasons why we have the gaps. So if you're starting with angels and then going to series A and the other sequences to get your financing, uh, that wheel is broken at the angel side. Also, life sciences is a more risky investment than information technology. Uh, we have to answer to the FDA. That's not fun. But uh, I, I think that the environment's changed remarkably in terms of the sequence of events from early funding to later. Do you find universities are a great partner for life science companies because of the STTR program and just that, you know, they, they have maybe better ability to get grants? Do you use universities more? One can do that. The problem that you end up with that, though, is the tech transfer offices and also trying to talk to the scientists and let them understand you're building a business out of their work. Mm -hmm. And as a consequence, it can be a tough thing hurting those cats. Mike Pratt, you're an expert in this stuff. I've watched you do it now for many years. What are some of the hints you'd give our entrepreneurs about how to grow a business without institutional capital? Well, yeah, so this is actually something that's, again, changed over the, over the years. But if you, um, what I always tell the students that are in, interested in what we're doing and who have their business ideas is don't take any money. <laughs> as long as you can. I agree with right. that. You know, you build, and everybody, I mean, the days of people funding, you know, uh, 
a, a company with an idea is are over. And so you have to figure out a way to, to bootstrap as much as you can and to uh, raise money from friends and family a, as you can. And the longer you can, I tell them, the longer you can go without taking institutional capital, and institutional capital, that's a general term. Let's say any, any outside capital, really, even from, from you know, somebody like us who are seed capital people, the better off you are. Because if you can continue to build your MVP and get a couple of people actually using your product before you actually bring in the outside capital, the ultimate result is you get a better, better valuation for your company. And so I say don't take capital until you absolutely have to. And, um, and, and you have to be prepared to, um, to have a, a, a product that you can actually go and actually show somebody and take, you know, I actually teach the uh, Steve Blank's, um, you know, lean startup process at, at Maryland. And, um, you know, that is a really interesting process that, that John Keeley talked about, is that you talk to customers first and figure out, do I actually have a product? Or, or if it's a product that they're interested in, how, can, how should it be developed? Before you ever think about, you know, a company or raising money or any of that stuff. Um, and, and continue to, to iterate based upon customer feedback so that you have an MVP which should be, according to the way I tell people, take your, your MVP, then cut it in half, and then cut it in half again. And that might be a product that's actually a good MVP to start with. That's one of the things I tell entrepreneurs, don't try to over-engineer early stage products because, you know, if, you don't, if, you don't, if you're not embarrassed by your first product that goes into the market, you probably waited too long. Is, is what I tell them. Yeah, so MVP, minimum viable product, it's a really important life lesson, uh, frankly, for any entrepreneur is that you, the only way to learn whether or not you're doing something constructive is to put it in front of people. And that's uh, it, a really scary thing to do. The other thing I'll point out is that another big school of thought for, for startups and product design is something called design thinking, which again is very much from the standpoint of empathy and understanding the customer. You know, there's a tremendous value in getting yourself out of the lab, getting yourself out of the space of the comfort of building something to actually put it in front of people. And by the way, put it in front of people doesn't mean people that like you, because people like you will pat you on the back and send you back in the game. It's going to people that don't know you. That's the most valuable data you can get. Somebody has no reason to like you or dislike you until they see your product. So we have a few moments. Do you have any questions? I mean, I've got some others that I could ask. Yes, ma'am. Um question for uh, SBIR. So uh, the region has really benefited a lot from SBIR grants and I've seen life sciences companies who use the SBIR grants to just add undiluted money to venture capital investments uh, become very, very successful. Um, at the same time, if you have a number of scientists who keep research, um, keep receiving SBIR grants, but never commercialized. And I think that the problem there is a cultural problem in the region, in that because we were so beneficiary of the resources, research, of the federal government, you know, we have... Those, those are all very true things, but do you have a question? Yeah, we have a lack of executive and business expertise here. And for our region to go to the rest, we need to shut in the arm um, from that side. Because the federal government has any programs in mind, would they fire them? So you're asking the federal government has programs to increase the level of executive talent that's available in the region? Well, yes. Uh, so uh, first, uh, within the SBIR program, we, we, you know, we, we try to help you commercialize it by, by, by sending you or by directing you to certain institutions or organizations or centers uh, to, to help you uh, advance your business needs. Now, uh, there's an office called, within the U.S. Small Business Administration called the Office of Entrepreneurial Development. And within uh, the Office of Entrepreneurial Development, OED, there's 11,000 resource partners across this country, it's 11, 1,100 resource partners across this country that will help a small business owner uh, take, the, take the ideal and scale it from a business uh, standpoint. And, um, and have you heard of SBDC, Small Business Development Centers, and scale programs? So, you know, as we continue to, to either have our field offices across this country that are government agencies within the SBA or within our resource partners that receive grants from our offices, those are great resources to help you 
um, to help you commercialize or to help you scale your business. And we always try to encourage the partnership between the SBIC fund managers because you know we, we, we're the largest fund of funds in the world that solely invest in American small businesses. We probably are the largest LP with the most GPs, 200 plus GPs. And so we're always looking for that connective tissue between our SBIR fund managers as well as our SBIC uh, investment managers. No, grant recipients and investment managers. So uh, the other thing I want to add there is, is that what you've identified is an enormous problem generally with SBIRs, which is that they're, they're not designed to actually, as it exists, attract startup entrepreneurs. They're designed to attract researchers, particularly on the Department of Defense side. I've spent a lot of time in that. Having said that, what you described, the issue of how do you get scientists matched up with entrepreneurs and business people, it's not that we have a chronic lack of those people here. What we have is a chronic lack of clear connection points. So I would encourage you, for example, to look out for the i program, which is something that the NSF has started, the SBAA is involved in, a number of us have taught in. That's a program that helps scientists figure out how to get out of the lab and start a product. The Accelerate DC is a program that a number of universities support, 1776. Eastern Foundry, Maryland Dingman Center, every university, Mason has a great entrepreneurs program. So if you can't figure out where else to go, to find an experienced entrepreneur to work with you? Well, first of all, you can ask Founders Corps. That's what we all do. Most of our members are involved in this in some way. But forgetting that, go to the university you're closest to and walk in and find out where their entrepreneurship center is. They're all magnets for those things. It also- You're shaking your head, but I can tell you. Uh, if I would have the money to be an investor, I invest in the jockey, because I know that the jockey is going to choose the right course, i.e. the technology, Right, so that, it will be. That, is that is certainly a viewpoint. I can tell you, speaking as an investor and somebody who spent years in the tech transfer world, getting a successful startup is, is always really, really hard. Most fail. Whether you've been in the jockey, the technology, that magical overlay between the two match with market, it's so ephemeral, so hard. So the reality here is that for those of you who are scientists, if you have a great idea and you think I need business expertise, there's places to get it. That, 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 that's the, the only point. And that's not the government's job. The government's job is to be a convener, but not, not to be the one to solve that problem. That's up to the private sector. Another question? Hey, Bob. Uh, Got time for one more? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Glad you added that. Uh, good question. We have a, a few pretty interesting medical device investments right now. Um, the one that comes to mind first is uh, I was just at a board meeting for, so it's fresh in my mind. Um, that's a company that developed a delivery technology to that will be used in place of an end-hole catheter by interventional radiologists. And what's relevant about it is that it creates pressure when it delivers therapy. And the result of the pressure is that the therapy hits the tumor site uh, at a much higher density or, or concentration, and the amount of uh, collateral damage, if you will, that typically occurs is reduced substantially. And what we think it's going to do is shift what is a highly surgically driven uh, practice in the market today to something that can be done in a minimally invasive, fairly quickly, quick uh, fashion and at a fairly low cost. So um, it's very, very exciting. It's currently they're focused on uh, primary and secondary liver cancer but they've got uh, a lot of clinical work, actually some at Johns Hopkins right now, um, in a number of other areas where the same technology can be used. So that's one that, that we're pretty enthusiastic about. One more maybe? All right, well, so, uh, so Nate's gonna go back downtown and figure out how to keep pumping money into our economy to help us be entrepreneurs. 
John and John are going to do a deal, and Mike Pratt's going to start two companies before lunch. So, well, well, how about that, that, that they invest in SBIR companies, so, so I'll, I'll pump more capital in, they invest in it, and then uh, you are the grant recipient. Wait, who, are you the one, who's the, which one's the scientist? He's the scientist. So, I'm, so I'm you're just the a talent. Yeah. And you're the investors, and yeah. we're all happy. And I'm just a schmuck that just hung out here with you guys. The, the broker dealer. The broker dealer, yeah, exactly. The dirty banker. So thanks very much for joining us this morning. Thank, thank you so much, Jonathan, John, Nate, John, and Mike.